Mm -hmm. Right. So um, just want to do a quick audio check uh, with somebody online. This is Fudge Courier with the State 9 and 8 Technical Advisory Board. Want to make sure the audio is being received online. If somebody could come off mute and just let me know that you can hear us. I can hear you. All right. Wonderful. Thank you very much. All right. My name is Budge Courier. Um, I am the chair of the 988 Technical Advisory Board. Uh, it is 10 o'clock. We're going to go ahead and start our meeting. And uh, those of you online, you can see the slides. The first order of business is a, a welcome and call to order. So welcome everybody to the meeting. I'm going to run through a quick roll call. Uh, as I said, I'm the chair and I'm present. I know Dr. Bowie is in route. She will be here shortly. Um, Dr. Eric Rafla Juan. Present. All right. Joe Sullivan. Present. Terry Galvin. Present. All right. And welcome, Terry. I know this is your first meeting, so thank you for joining us. Uh, Terry is representing WellSpace, and so we certainly appreciate you having part of the board, and so welcome aboard. Julian Aragon. Present. Lon Nguyen. Is he online? I'm here. All yes, right, I'm, I'm, I'm here. Okay, and just confirming that you're, um, if there's anybody else present with you at your location? No, just me. Okay, thank you. All right, Kristen Miller. I'm here. Demetria Sidney. Present. Jeff Abair. Okay, not seeing him. Tracy Gonzalez. Not seeing her. All right, Jennifer Kenton. Present. Thank you. And just confirming that you're uh, in the location you're at, if there's anyone else present with you? Uh, no, not in my office. Okay, thank you. Aaron Riley. Present, you and no, no one else is here. Okay, thank you, Aaron. And then Serena Lewis. Present. <clears throat> right. Sorry, present. Thank you, Serena. Okay, so we have a quorum, and uh, if anyone else joins, uh, if you see online, either Jeff or Tracy, let us know, and we'll let you. Uh, you also know if anybody else joins us in the room. So, the next slide. I just uh, wanted to thank you all for being here in person. The new rules that changed. We, you know, we have an obligation to have a majority of members present in person in order to establish a quorum. So thank you all to everybody who took the trip up here. We really appreciate it. And uh, we look forward to your ongoing participation in the board. All right, next item of business is meeting minutes from May. Those meeting minutes were sent out uh, to members of the board. So first we'll entertain if anybody has any updates or changes to the minutes. All right, seeing, hearing none, do we have a motion to approve? Move for approval. Right. Okay, so we have a, a motion from uh, Joe, and then I think if I heard that right, that was you, Lon, that gave the second? Yes. All right, and we have a second from Lon. All right, we will go through and, and do a roll call vote of the minutes. All right. Dr. Bowie's not present, so Julian. Yes. Kristen. Yes. Demetrius. Yes. Okay, Jeff and Tracy are not here. Jennifer. Yes. Aaron. Yes. Serena. Yes. Eric. Yes. Lon? Yes. Joe? Yes. And then Terry, we know you weren't here, so you'll probably have to abstain. Yeah. All right. Okay. So um, the. I think we're still good, right? We still have a majority. Yeah. Okay. All right. So we're good to go with that. Just checking with legal to make sure procedurally we're following everything. All right. So thank you all for that. Um, we'll move on to agenda item number three. I think we have Paul from our legislative and external affairs office online. So, Paul, take it away, sir. 
Thank you, Bud. Uh, can everyone hear me all right? Yes, indeed. Great. Uh, my name is Paul McGinnis, Legislative uh, Coordinator um, in the Office of Legislative and Governmental Affairs at Cal OES. Thanks again for the opportunity to give a brief uh, ledge update to the board this morning. Um, a couple quick notes uh, before I get into a few specific bills. Um, we are nearing the um, end of the legislative session. Um, last week was the suspense file hearing on the 15th, so we saw a fair amount of bills uh, be held in that uh, committee or significantly significantly amended um, coming out of the committee. So some of the bills that were included um, at the last meeting may not be included in this since they were um, held or, or amended to um, alleviate some some of the concerns or the issue areas. Um, Tomorrow, the 23rd is actually the last day for um, bills to be amended on the floor, and then um, session will um, conclude on the 31st. So just a little over a week. Um, the governor then has um, all of the month of September to uh, sign or veto bills that are on his desk. So the deadline there is September 30th for, for his action on, on all bills that make it to his desk. <clears throat> So I just have a, a few um, state bills that I'd like to um, give quick summaries on. And then um, if you have any questions on any other bills or any of these, I'm happy to take those. So first is AB um, 1863, Assembly Member Ramos. Um, this bill uh, revises the existing feather alert statute um, by changing the conditions required to request an activation and what is expected from uh, CHP during the request and activation process. Uh, this bill is enrolled uh, and is on the governor's desk awaiting his action. Uh, next is AB 2765, uh, Assemblymember Pellerin. Uh, the bill would re require uh, PUC to develop and implement uh, rules to conduct random annual facility checks to verify the providers of telecommunication service are in compliance with their plans regarding backup electricity for telecommunications infrastructure. That bill is on a third reading on the Senate floor. Uh, AB 3090, Assembly Member Mainshine, the bill uh, authorizes and encourages uh, public water systems when updating an emergency notification plan to provide notification to water users by means of other technology uh, communications technology, including but not limited to text message, email or social media um, outlets. That bill um, was signed into law in January. Um, so it is it is uh, existing law as of now. AB uh, next AB 3179 um, Assembly Member Carrillo. Uh, this bill uh, through January 2030 uh, would exempt emergency commu uh, telecommunications vehicles um, that are owned or purchased by emergency telecommunications providers from specified zero emissions regulations. Um, the further um, requirements would be that that uh, that equipment uh, participates in the federal EAS system or provides access to 911 emergency services or provides wireless connectivity during service outages. And then lastly, I just wanted to share a bill because it came up uh, yesterday's um, 911 meeting, but SB 610. Uh, the bill would have established a new framework under the authority of the state fire marshal to identify areas of the state for fire mitigation, replacing the state's existing fire hazard severity zone mapping. And that bill actually did die in committee. So that one was held. Just wanted to highlight that one as well for the for the board. Um, that's all the uh, legislation I uh, was going to share this morning, but happy to answer any questions if there are any. Thanks, Budge. All right, thank you, Paul. Do we have any questions from the board for Paul, related to any of the legislative updates that he provided or anything that you're tracking that, that he did not go over. All right, any questions or comments from the public on agenda item number three? All right, seeing, hearing none, thank you. 
move on to agenda item number four. So just noticing from our attendance, uh, the report from working group, the first working group will be rather light since they are not present today. Um, those of you that have been tracking that first uh, working group, there is a draft 911 to 988 um, policy or guidance document that's been circulated. The current version of that is on our website. What we asked the working group to do was to gather up all the feedback that we've received, and we've received um, quite a bit of feedback from both state agencies, from the Calnina chapter, and from others relating to that guidance document. And we've asked them to meet as a group and come with a recommendation to the advisory board as to what that updated document would look like. This work also dovetails into what the 988 advisory um, board is working on as well with their five-year implementation plan. So there's some overlap there. So during November's meeting is when we're gonna have a really robust discussion on this. Um, and we've got another standing agenda item later in, the, in, in today's meeting where we can talk further, but um, that's what that working group is, is, has been focused on. Happy to you know, see if there's any questions that we might be able to answer right now, but for the most part, that conversation will happen in November. So any comments or questions related to the first working group? All right, for the second working group, um, Eric, I'm not sure if you're gonna report out, but for our accessibility and equal access working group, we've got Eric and uh, Antu both in the room with us. So uh, take it away, Eric, for your report. Thank you, sir. Yeah, thanks, Budge. And, and I'll start in if, Antu, if you have anything to add, then feel free. Um, so Antu and I co-chair the Ex equity and accessibility working group <clears throat> and continuing to discuss how we can really make vision of 98 accessible to everyone no matter where they are in California's 58 counties. Um, one of the items we're continuing to work on is build representation in the working group. So AB 988 from last year that was um, signed into law requires 988 reporting and statistics and data to include um, veterans. And we don't have any veterans in our work group currently. So that's an example of one. Um, Another thing that we discussed was geo-routing and public-facing information about what geo-routing is and what's being proposed. Um, there, we've noticed a lot of misinformation or misunderstandings kind of circulating in the general public, as well as unfortunately being propagated by different journalists. So it's, a, it's coming up in different news articles about the conflation between geolocation, geolocation-based routing, geo-routing. And there is not a kind of definitive resource that's um, at, at Cal OES or at another government agency at this time in California that we can point them to, like, this is a reference for that. Um, so, so that um, is something that, that may be of interest to this advisory board. Um, another thing that has come up is that there is no mechanism for consumers to provide feedback on 988 at this point. And so if a 988 user did wish to provide feedback on their experience with 988, uh, right now, their option is to do it for the 988 national platform through, um, through Vibrant, which is then chartered under New York state laws. And so this is not a very accessible or perhaps useful um, feedback mechanism for our purposes, what, what we're doing here in California. So whether that's something that's developed here at Cal OES or that's a, kind of a, a joint agency, because I imagine people calling in will be giving feedback on various things to do with 988, not just specifically the technology, which is what we're focused on here. But uh, at this point, that's something we can look into. Um, and then the final thing I will share with is just thinking about how we can increase public awareness and engagement with um, this process here at the 988 Technical Advisory Board. And so there are some limitations that we can't get around through statute like locked building and things like this. Um, but many stakeholder groups are not aware that this board exists or that these meetings occur. And so members in the work group have been doing their best to try and, and improve the awareness and um, engagement with this process. Uh, but I still think that there's more that we can do as board to whether it's advertising, some other boards do meetings in different parts of the state in order to try and um, boost participation or give uh, more folks the ability to participate. 
So I'm not sure exactly what we have as options statutorily with the Cal OES and the, you know, the locked buildings and other security concerns, which are, are very real, but figuring out whether advertising materials or things like this beyond just saying we have a website you can go to. So, and then our experience has been that the more engagement there is with the process, the more interest and the more eventual use of the services and trust in the services there will be. Okay, thank you. Do you have anything to add? And by the way, I should have announced um, Dr. Bowie has joined us, so welcome. Um, so we will add you to the roll, but uh, if you have the mic, go ahead. Thank you for your patience. Hit some traffic between Berkeley and Sacramento. Um, so uh, I did want to add, and thank you, Eric, for uh, highlighting the need to um, recruit more um, members to the work group uh, for a better representation of, our, of the people we serve. Um, I think I just want to add maybe some specific asks to the board um, if there's a way that we could develop some public-facing materials about that's beyond what's on the website right now um, that can be disseminated disseminated to the public in order for us to, say, recruit more members or for them to know about the work of the board, that would be greatly appreciated. Okay, and then I have a, a general question, which you may not be able to answer, but for overlap between the policy board and the technical advisory board, has there been much discussion on the um, 90 day um, crisis advisory board for this type of activity to continue in that environment or is the thought that that this working group would would exist in this environment within the technical advisory board in other words because your advisory board is shorter lived than ours in statute it could go longer I, I know but it's not required to and so I think the idea was that advisory board will probably not meet much beyond when the implementation plan is completed. So just want to really stimulate some thoughts from this entire board as to where we want that work effort to reside. Don't have to make a decision. Remember, this is the recommendation board, but just some thought around that. Anybody have any ideas? Non-binding ideas again. Yeah. <laughs> So something that um, many of the stakeholders and our, even our work group members have struggled with is figuring out, is this something that lives, or which agency or which advisory group does certain items live under? Um, because at times, technology can be quite distinct from the policy, but other times, policy is really influenced by the technology, or they go hand in hand. And then in terms of the explaining that distinction to the general public or to other stakeholders, that gets even more tricky. Um, and so in my mind in terms of promoting the goals of equity and accessibility, um, continuing to build stakeholder engagement through the process, whatever side of the agency it's on is going to be important. And if at times they have feedback that's not quite as relevant, then you can direct them to the right place. Uh, but there have been things that have been very specifically focused on technology. For example, specific items about the CRM, which is you know very kind of falls squarely under Cal OES here. So I think there's definitely utility in that. Okay. Any other thoughts from the board on that? Um, this is Julian. I'd be very interested to hear, since the policy board is meeting to create this five-year implementation plan, what part of their plan makes space for this type of public engagement and feedback? So I think if we knew how that existed or where their thoughts are headed, the technical side can better support that. Okay, thank you, Julian. I, I, I certainly see the tie in there. I don't know if you have any thoughts you want to share on that. I know you have a presentation later, but if you want to, any thoughts on where you, if the implementation plan addresses recommendations on some of these items that we're talking about. In terms of stakeholder uh, and community engagement, um, it's been a very robust uh, process uh, from multiple directions. So there's been specifically the 43 member policy advisory group members and then the seven work groups that have been meeting um, over the past year, as well as um, I, I believe a dozen focus groups 
that represent populations of focus um, for the work that we're doing. Um, but all that is very specific to feedback for recommendations for the five-year implementation plan, some of which you'll see later does include inf um, recommendations regarding the technology piece. Um, and it, it certainly includes um, feedback from this technical advisory board members who also sit on the policy advisory group. I don't believe we've really discussed truly how the work can continue. Um, I, I think that is a, a piece that would require, like you said, some discussion uh, to think about how this would continue, uh, given that this technical advisory board continues to meet into 2028. Uh, we can disband our policy advisory group no later than January of 2025. We have started to talk about how do we continue the work because it's clearly not done, uh, but certainly would love to hear feedback and thoughts because nothing's been decided yet. Yeah, so um, any other thoughts on that? Go ahead. Yeah, Is that this long? Is long, uh, long. Yeah, go ahead. I, I'm, yeah, I'm wondering if, the, if this uh, technical advisory board can continuously looking at the work that's being done by the policy board and take on some of the um, related um, items or issues uh, if uh, so that we can continue doing doing the work if and when the uh, policy board um, uh, no longer meet and, and work on those uh, issues and recommendations. Yeah, so if I'm hearing you correctly, Lon, the idea would be if there are specific things needed to support the implementation of the implementation plan, which, yes, I used implementation in the same sentence back to back, <laughs> yeah. so my, my wife, the English major, would probably be cringing right now, but um, <laughs> then maybe an idea would be to form a working group off of this board that HHS or DHCS or whichever appropriate state agency would chair and then continue the work on. Um, so that would be one option. And then to clearly identify those roles and, you know, so certainly, you know, if the board members want to give that some thought, uh, we can have a more robust conversation in November. We can add that as spe specifically as an agenda item of what we could consider. Um, but, but take that back to the organizations that you represent. We obviously know it's confusing as to which of the two groups are working on what, but right now, fundamentally, if you read the statute, the um, implementation plan was developed under the guidance of this policy advisory board for that specific purpose. And the legislation really didn't contemplate that board moving on beyond that. It didn't say it couldn't, but it wasn't specific. So if you go read the statute, it's, um, you know, you kind of connect the dots like that. But this board does exist. And so there is some overlap between the two. So we certainly would, would welcome some input and, you know, all of you, the agencies you represent please come back um, and, and really consider, you know, what we should be doing. The other things I heard were a reference document relative to geo-routing data and some information to clarify what that exactly is. We're going to cover a little bit of that today when we give an update uh, from what we're seeing with the FCC proceedings. And when that is complete, there'll be a lot more clarity there. But, but I, I think you're right. That's something we can look at. As far as customer feedback, I don't think we had contemplated that. I don't know if the implementation plan contemplates a customer feedback mechanism on the performance of the system, we've contemplated the metrics to demonstrate calls are being answered and, you know, that from, from, a, from a metric standpoint, technology perspective, we've contemplated that, but we haven't gone beyond that, mainly because we're not clinical experts and we don't know. Um, from a technology perspective, if things are being effective, but I don't know if the implementation plan considers that at all. Customer feedback loop to demonstrate effectiveness of the program. It will. It will have to. Uh, we we have heard that loud and clear. Um, it's a question about which specific state entity department will be responsible for that. Um, and that's still under discussion. But all will become more clear in one month. <laughs> <laughs> and then the final thing I heard um, was just the public awareness um, and what that looks like and, and, you know, how they can participate in this. So, 
you know, advertising more about these meetings, um, pursuing alternative locations. We can meet anywhere we want. Uh, we just need to know about 45 days out of where that would be. And we've asked the board members to please let us know if there's somewhere that you think would be better to meet than here. As of yet, we've had zero recommendations. So we continue to meet here, but we are more than willing um, and able um, the team would love to travel and, and do this show on the road. I'm sure I'm looking at them over there and they're like, yes. Um, so we can certainly do that. So if there's a board member who has a space for us, uh, we really don't have funding, that much funding in the budget to rent a space. But if there's a space available that could, could um, meet our needs, we certainly could do that. Absolutely. And that's an open invitation. Let us know. Like I said, the good idea for that November meeting will expire around the 1st of October. It's too late at that point. We then could look at the following meeting uh, in, in um, 2025. So uh, all of you, um, just please keep in mind, if you have some place you want us to go, we can absolutely go there. All right, so those are my comments that, that I was tracking. Any other conversation from the board members on this agenda item? Okay, any member, uh, any um, public comment on agenda item number four, either in the room or online? Okay, all right, moving on to agenda item number five. So I'm gonna ask uh, Jessica to come up and, and give us a report. I am super excited because uh, this is the first board meeting where I am no longer the 988 system director for Cal OES. We have hired somebody, so uh, Dr. Jessica Sodi is going to come up uh, to the mic here and she's going to give us a brief out on item number five. Yes, you can have the clicker, absolutely. And um, so she's been in this role about 30 days. So yes, indeed, 30 days in, we're having her report out. Um, if there's questions that, you know, um, date back prior to 30 days, I may assist a little bit, but we're, we're doing our best to do the handoff and we thought it was most important that we introduce you um, to her and give her an opportunity to interact with the board. So uh, we're really excited about her joining us and me personally, a, a huge amount of my workload has now been adjusted and that's good for me, maybe not so good for her, but I'll let her speak for herself. So please take it away. Thank you for that introduction. Uh, so you can move the mic a little closer, I think. Uh, most of these updates should be uh, pretty quick. Um, there hasn't been uh, much change, uh, as you all know. Um, so uh, regarding the 98 CHS and CRM status, um, that testing was completed back in May of this year, where we validated calls, chat, and text. Uh, where we comply with all the requirements that are set forth with, uh, by SAMHSA and Vibrant, uh, and we are able to provide the reporting data that's necessary uh, and required by SAMHSA. Uh, we're still waiting on approval from SAMHSA to begin the phase deployment. Um, so what this will look like is that uh, once we get approval uh, and that we use the agreements are in place, uh, that uh, six months uh, after approval, we'll get calls and then we'll get nine months after approval um, for text and chat. Uh, the, the one update um, here is that the 98 mobile dispatch RFP um, which is available on the Cal E-Procure website, um, has entered into the negotiation phase and we're anticipating a contract award date of sometime in September of this year, so within the coming month. Um, again, with the uh, 911 and 988 um, interface, um, so um, as you all know in government code, um, the Office of Emergency Services is required to verify the interoperability of both next gen 911 and 988. Uh, we've done that, and that certification was uh, provided at the end of April uh, earlier this year. Uh, and again, uh, we intend to deploy this technology to all 12 centers once we have the go-ahead uh, from SAMHSA. Revisiting uh, the, the surcharge uh, slide, I'm sure you've all seen the budget presentation. Uh, so, as you know, uh, surcharge was set at $0.08 cents in 2023 and 2024 um, by state statute uh, for 2025 and beyond, and this is for calendar year, um, this fee must be calculated. Um, so right now, through the budget process, 
we're um, certainly the second point, right, where the legislators approve the budget, there is an enacted budget document that's been published, and that sets the revenue that must be generated from the surcharge. Um, after that, we're, uh, we're gathering access line data, and then we'll use that data to calculate the surcharge based on the number of access lines and go ahead and send that over to CDCFA by October of this year. This is the infamous slide. <laughs> What's highlighted in, in red uh, represents has been uh, given to CHHS, um, is in yellow um, for OES, broken down into state operations and local assistance, and the one in green uh, representing a DHCS, again broken down uh, into state uh, operations and local assistance. Um, this is the enacted um, document, so the the changes here are negligible from uh, what you've seen a uh, budget present. Here's a, a draft uh, statement, just again, kind of a high level overview of how this calculation will occur. So once we confirm the number of access lines, uh, actually going to look at the total expenditures and uh, expenditure adjustments, then account for any adjustments uh, to determine the revenue that's needed um, for the next budget year. We then look at the total number of access lines. Um, and so current surcharge is at eight cents, uh, times that by 12, times that by the number of access lines. And we want the number in B5 um, to be um, at least uh, equal to or as close as it can be uh, to the line item in B2, because that means that the rate of the surcharge that uh, we've determined would uh, meet the revenue needs for the next budget year. Um, and uh, so 98 implementation milestones and technical advisory board tasks. Uh, again, a government uh, code uh, and it's that we established and convened uh, the state technical advisory board. Uh, and we work on plans for interoperability between 988, 911, uh, behavioral to services, which is why we're all here um, online. Uh, the development of the technical and operational standards uh, and the creation of standards and protocols um, for 911 and 98 called transfers, um, which is something we'll get to later. Uh, in order to facilitate uh, some of those milestones, um, one of the things I've done is conducted uh, visits with each of the 98 centers. Um, so I did want to thank each of the 12 centers um, because if I haven't gotten to you yet, um, all 12 centers agreed to have me visit, um, which is that you're taking time out of your day and your um, business operations uh, to meet with me. So one, it was really great to be able to meet with the centers so far, be able to meet your teams, be able to see the site, um, but also to just establish and, and foster uh, collaboration and communication uh, between myself right, and on behalf of OES from the technical perspective uh, and each center individually. And um, so what I've said it with the center so far is that there's 12 centers and there's gonna be 12 different approaches as to how we go about this process uh, and that's okay. So uh, each of you are serving, um, there's just unique needs. Some of you um, have a couple local lines, some have well over a dozen local lines um, so what is your center doing and how can we best support 988 uh, from a technology standpoint um, over here at, at Palo OES? Um, so again, eight of the visits are completed. Um, there's four more sites that I have to visit, which will occur in the, hopefully uh, by the end of the month, if not early September, it should be done with all of them. Uh, some of the insights that I've gained while talking with the centers um, is one for your day-to-day -day business operations. Um, so that's been helpful. Um, you know, how many staff do you have? Uh, are they in person or are they remote? Or do you have a hybrid staffing schedule? Um, what does that look like? It, uh, a lot of centers are staffed by volunteers. Um, so uh, what are the challenges that uh, you're facing? That was very insightful because it provides you the perspective of kind of what uh, roadblocks or hurdles are you facing um, that are important to your center. Um, but I also learned a lot about like the innovative solutions that each center um, is using to address the challenges. Right? So while they don't have staff um, uh, or if they're, they're short staffed, well, um, they may have a significant number of volunteers. 
to support efforts in the meantime. Um, and they have actually noticed that the volunteers are like really passionate, right? They're really driven. And it's a solution that's worked well as a, a placeholder. Um, for some of the centers, um, while we kind of await uh, the approval from SAMHSA to implement technology, uh, depending on the area, right, we've uh, got some 911 diversion, and they've uh, developed uh, really great working relationships uh, with the PSAPs um, within their city and county uh, to be able to accept uh, 911 calls. And there was also um, a desire for both um, like leadership and an advocate. So uh, again, you know, something that would plan to fulfill in my role. Um, there were, uh, it was also a great opportunity to be able to clarify points of confusion, um, for example, like, you know, regarding budgets, um, what kind of Cal OES is responsible for. So uh, being able to reiterate that we're responsible from a technology standpoint. Um, but if you it raised concerns you know, during these visits, um, about something that may be more operational based, you can just take that back um, to our you know, uh, CHHS and DHCS partners um, and bring that to the table um, just so they're aware. So, uh, and there was, uh, Budge will touch on it later, um, but uh, some confusion of geo-routing versus geolocation. So is it kind of a quick like down and dirty overview? Um, I, think, I think of geo-routing as being able to tell me that I'm in Sacramento I think of geolocation as being more precise and being able to tell you know, like the building that I'm in. So, um, but being able to um, clarify that uh, those two terms have kind of very significant um, distinctions to be made, especially as we work to preserve like the privacy of the 90-day uh, contacts uh, there. And with that, I think that was quite a lot. But if, all right, so any questions from the board for Jessica? Or if they're really hard, she's going to make me answer them, I think, <laughs> which is fine. All right, any questions from the board or anything that you're expecting us to report out on that you didn't hear about? We're happy to provide any update that you all uh, need or, or that we can provide. Go ahead, Serena. I have a question. Um, has it been established yet how, um, what the triggers are as far as like the 911 center will, um, okay, this. There has been, it's been determined that they don't need the immediate medical attention, so then we transfer it over to 988. Um, has it been established yet what the triggers are for 988 to then transfer it back over to 911? Or I think that's like a perfect segue into that document, right? Yeah, so the, <clears throat> po the guidance policy that's published online does contemplate those exact questions. And I think the majority of the feedback we've gotten so far is really asking either for us to be overly prescriptive in when that happens to the point that you could inadvertently miss a use case that a dispatcher or a counselor, dispatcher on the 911 side versus a, a counselor on the 988 side would be empowered to make that decision. So we're trying to be very careful there. Uh, but we did address those at a high level. And at this point, it's just a uh, guidance document because we recognize that the needs and capabilities, as, as um, Jessica has, has um, discovered with these visits, varies from center to center. And the approach we've taken in 911 is, here's your general guidance that we, the state, are providing to you. And we focus a lot on how long it takes to answer a call, um, uh, what you do to transfer the call, and that kind of stuff. And then the detailed operational impacts at the local level beyond that we, we don't we tend to be not overly prescriptive um, so that's been a lot of the feedback we've gotten so far the risk would be that if you say in this case you must do such and such and that doesn't align to what is happening real time as the situation unfolds and we're really trying to balance those things and that's where the document sits right now and I think until we get it published and implemented we're not going to really know the effectiveness of it because those of us that are developing the policy are not the ones answering the calls. And so we have to really be careful of that. And that, that's, I know that's kind of a roundabout way to answer your question, but take a look at the guidance documents out there and, and let us know if, if we're going either too far or not enough. And that's really where the discussion is centered right now. We're trying to come in in that you know, balance point. The state sometimes can be, um, you know, we've all seen something that comes out that seems like a great idea, properly vetted, you know, collaboratively developed, and then when you go to implement it, you're like, oh, 
I didn't think about that. And so we know this is going to be an iterative process. Go ahead, Dr. Bui. Yeah, thank you for that question. I think it's um, very important to highlight. And just from a very uh, basic and maybe naive standpoint, um, I'm aware that the transfer from 988 to 911, there are established standards and protocols already for when 98 centers would call 911, particularly if there are medical emergencies. Now, um, I'm also learning that um, on the 911 side to contact behavioral health, I believe that EMS is involved because it's determined to be, it's, it's a medical or behavioral health kind of thing. So EMS has oversight from a state perspective over ensuring the clinical quality and standards. So part of what we're trying to figure out from the Health and Human Services Agency side is to ensure that there's equal um, triaging standards so that we don't miss any of those scenarios that we cannot contemplate sitting here at this level. Um, so that's some of the pieces we're trying to figure out and making sure that there is some kind of guidance on a medical triage standpoint so that 911-98 are equivalent, you know, you get the same kind of medical attention that you will need by calling either number. That's, that's the goal. Any other questions or conversation relative to the report? I have a question. Go ahead. <clears throat> Uh, so I've gotten a number of questions from stakeholders about are the overarching state budgetary situations going to affect 988 operations? And my understanding and general answer to them has been um, specifically for 988, it is a little bit insulated because it has a the surcharge and that uh, generates the, the, the uh, funding that is used to operate the direct 988 services. Um, the other services are not attached to that funding and therefore may be more um, in flux if there are budgetary changes at the state level. Is that an accurate answer in terms of how 988 is operating in terms of uh, like from the Cal OES side? Yeah, so on, I think for, for us at the state level, it is a special fund. Um, we track closely the revenue coming into the fund, which is generated by those access lines. And as of yet, we, we don't see anything impacting them. But the legislature is still in session. The conversations are still underway with the budget. So we'll have to be tracking that closely. But right now, you know, we're, we're not seeing any impact. So I, I, um, it, if ahead, I Mark. could, uh, yeah, but I, I'd like to sh share in a, a concern. And I don't know where it's going to lie <laughs> or land on uh, with this, uh, with the technical advisory board and whether it's, it's going to be something that can be, look, that can be looked into. So because um, because of the the core rollover and core routing issue, um, and also relate to some budgetary concerns, and that's why some of the 988 centers are still not ready to receive number one call, um, even if the so call guidance or, or MOU between the two organizations has been established, and the, the main issue and concern for these 98 centers is that they don't have the cap stacking staffing capacity to handle additional calls transfer from 911 that's one issue the other issue is that the number one agencies um, are are concerned about a, a call rollover for 98 uh, for example if a 98 call being transferred or if a call being transferred to 98 if that call doesn't get picked up within 45 seconds or um, or a minute, it rolls over to a backup 988 centers. The local number one agencies that does not want for their call to be rolled over, for example, from Secretary County, County uh, a call being rolled over to a call center uh, from LA to LA or Sacramento and so on, they'd like to keep it within the jurisdictions. So those are some of the, the concern. And, and because of that, they asked for a an internal backline from the from the local 98 centers to just transfer there directly rather than transfer to 98. The concern with that is that 98 would only pay or would only uh, base funding to 98 centers based on a call that route to 98 and not to a local line. 
So all of those stuff are things that that maybe this technical aversion board can look at. I I I don't know if if we could, but that certainly worth considering because it's going to be impact ninety day and number one central operations. Okay, so I heard three questions. Um, concern about staffing capacity at the 90 day uh, center to handle 911 diversion. We've done the calculations on that and based on what we're seeing in states that have really good data and some of the data that we have available in California, if you look at about a 1% or so is of 911 calls could potentially roll to 911, I'm sorry, 911 calls could roll to 988. 1% of 27 million is a large number. Right. Uh, and we are, and, yeah, and, we, and we're, we're aware of that. So we, we are in the middle of having those conversations right now to do some predictions on what staffing would be needed to support this. And that's part of the work that we're doing as we visit the centers is to gather the data to help us at least start that conversation. So we're tracking this. We don't have an answer for you today, but we do know it's a concern. And so that's on our to-do list. The idea of rolling over to another 988 center, if in fact you're transferring from 911 to 988 and to roll to another center, the technology, once deployed, would absolutely support the ability not to do that rollover. So if oh, that's, great. so so we can, now we need to get you the technology first, which <laughs> we have not gotten the green light to do, but we did build that capability into the technology. So we anticipated that. And that can be configured um, locally based on what your individual center has a relationship with the corresponding PSAP. So we can accommodate that one. As far as the call counts, if you look at our funding policy, which is in Chapter 13 of our um, funding policy online with Cal OES, we include those warm lines, direct dial lines, there's a bunch of terms that are used to describe the way that you uh, reach a center if you're not reaching a center on a 98 line. And we include those in our counts with some caveats because these are nonprofit organizations and if you're supporting a separate business line that's not related to 98, we, we, we can't count those. But everything that's coming into your center um, to support those that need help from a crisis perspective we include those counts in everything we do for our analysis. And we do that for 911, and we do that for 98. Because in the 911 world, the same thing happens. There may be somebody who knew the phone number to the sheriff's department 40 years ago, and that's what they have in their phone for 911, because that's how they reach the sheriff, or that's how they reach the fire department, or that's how they reach uh, the police department. And so we include those uh, in all of our statistics, and we would, uh, once our technology is deployed, we have a much better idea on those metrics, but generally it's it's a two for one. We, we just assume that either two to, I think it might even be three times, three times the number of 911 calls come into the center because of the number of administrative lines is the term it's used for in 911. We do a similar calculation on the 98 side because we don't want to underestimate. Where things get challenging is how many actual people do you need answering calls at a specific instant in time to provide the level of service that's expected? We can't answer that question today because we need more detailed statistics than are available but we can make some predictions from it and that's kind of where we're at. So all of these things, and Jessica and I sat down for, I don't know, what was it, four hours or something? Running through all these calculations for this very reason. So we're really excited about the day when we can get real statistics, um, but right now we'll do the best we can. So if there's any centers out there that have some detailed statistics they're willing to share, for, share with us, we'll go through our analysis um, and that's kind of where we are in the process. So. We hear you loud and clear, and we agree with you. We're, 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 we're addressing this. Thank you so much, Chris. Appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. All right, any other comments or conversation on that? Go ahead, Eric. I have, I have a piece. Thank you for going through all that. It's very helpful. Exciting to hear about the data. Um, the, a lot is kind of hinging on this deployment of the CRM. It's, you know, it's slower than we would like, not 
because of our fault here, but because of other partners that we are working with at the federal level. Any idea on what they are waiting for, what they have said that they are looking to see happen, either on their end or on the state's end? So initially it was to make sure that what we were going to deploy would enable them to complete what they need to do from, from their statutory perspective at the federal level. And we spent a lot of time demonstrating that. That's really what we wanted. And we, we, we quite frankly, had the same desire. And that took us time. We've, we've finished that. So now once we've demonstrated that, we're working through the details of how do we actually get that done from a, an agreement perspective. And agreements between agencies are challenging. And so that's where we are right now. We're just working through how do we... It's not that we're in disagreement, but how do we get it on a paper where people can actually sign? That's that's not as not as easy as it sounds. <laughs> Is that a three year, six year, twelve month, or sorry, three month, six month, twelve month? Hopefully not three year. Yeah. Um, kind of anticipation. We're, we're hoping weeks, not months, and okay. certainly not years. Okay. Okay. Well, it's exciting, and thank you. And one of my experience has been that California and the work that Cal OES is doing is leading the nation in this, and so we are cutting stone at the federal level on, on this. And, and quite frankly, that's part of the challenge is that they realize that what we do will set precedent. And so we want to get it right, and, and we appreciate their diligence in making sure that we get it as close to right as we can. So yeah, absolutely. All right. Any other conversation related to agenda item number five? Go ahead, Julie. Uh, so I had heard from Lan um, just I, I don't know if I heard this addressed when you were mentioning budge. There is this, uh, and I'm not as close to the budgeting process as other advisory board members are, but there is this question about um, when, in the current state, when centers are receiving calls from the national network that Vibrant oversees their system, that's tracked as like national 988 volume. However, when we are in the state, when we're receiving 911 diversion from local PSAPs, that volume is not visible to Vibrant. So any type of like funding or budgeting that centers do with Vibrant won't necessarily accommodate for that volume. So I know this is probably not in the area of the technical advisory board, but it is a question for how California is planning to like incorporate that in whatever budgets they have for the program side for 988, because if we are expecting 1% to be transferred, then in order to fund the staffing, like those funds will need to be provided for. Yeah, so where we're starting our calculations, so your, your points are valid. The data that we get from SAMHSA via Vibrant through the um, information they provide to the state is only 988 calls. And we know that the data, you know, originates from their platform. So as Jessica has gone center to center, she's validating, trying to validate as much as they can, that the number that we've been given for your center is accurate. Can we accurately describe the number of 98 calls? Are they 100% accounted for? If, if in fact, and not, we're not just talking about the ones you answer, we want to know all the ones you receive because we know that not 100% are answered. We're, we're working toward that goal. So if we can get that number accurate and we can get an accurate metric on the average time it takes you to service that particular person seeking help, then from there, we can do all the math we need to do to do a, a very good prediction on what your center should be staffed at to accommodate the additional calls that are coming in on warm lines or direct dial lines and the 911 diversion, if we have that base number right. So that'll give us year one. Once we have that, our goal is to get the technology deployed so we have accurate statistics to get us even more granular. And then we can start to look at year two, three, four, five, and on down the road. But we have to start somewhere. And the data point that we have that we're relying on most heavily is how many 988 calls you get today. 
And so that's the work that we're doing right now. And when we finish that, we'll come back to every center and we'll say, hey, here's what you told us. Here's what we heard. Here's the math that we're doing. This is what we think would be reasonable in terms of staffing. And then we'll start that conversation. So, and that's kind of where we are right now in the process. Thank you, Budge. Yeah. It's, uh, we wish we had perfect data. We do not. <laughs> All right. Okay, any other questions from the board on agenda item number five? Okay, any questions from the public on agenda item number five? I think we have one online. Go ahead and come off mute, please, and ask your question. Is it me, Bud, that you're asking? Yeah. Sorry. I, yeah. Yes. Hi, Jerry, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Bud. Um, so glad to hear that you and Jessica, Dr. Sodi, are working on looking at real numbers in terms of call volume and call length and things like that to determine what's needed for funding for the system. And I just want to, um, you asked if any centers had any information, and in fact, we all do. Um, you know, we did a lot of that when we worked with DHCS to do the three-year budget um, request that where we were asked for several, almost a year ago now. And so, um, you know, it's more than just how many calls are being answered and how long are the calls. There's, there's a lot of other things that we need to look at in terms of training of staff, staff time off to do follow-up, all the other things that go into running a center. And so I just really implore you all that not to do those calculations in a bubble. We'd really love to be part of those conversations and share anything that we already have with you as, as a way to inform that process. All right, thank you. And that's, um, we're excited about that and I'm excited that we have somebody on our team who can do this work now instead of me. So <laughs> there you go, Jessica. That's awesome. <laughs> All right, thank you, Sherry. We appreciate that. Any other public comment online or that you're seeing? Okay, thank you very much. We will move on to agenda item number six, and I believe you have a presentation for us. You're going to get the clicker, and we'll let you take it away, Dr. Bowie. Thank you so much. Um, so this is the... Uh, usual uh, Cal HHS update on the 9 to 8 crisis project. So I'm going to go over some uh, highlights um, of what we've been doing and some deadlines that are coming up imminently. We'll update you on some work that has been done and most importantly we'd like to highlight draft recommendations that had surfaced publicly uh, at last week's policy advisory group meeting and really highlight the intersection with the work that's being done at the technical advisory board level and outline for you some next steps and uh, places where your input will be most um, valued and appreciated. Uh, just This is just a quick highlight for those of you, I, I'm not sure if there's some new folks in the room, but um, the AB 98 legislation did um, outline the roles and responsibilities. Uh, for Cal OES and Cal HHS in particular, besides the five-year implementation plan that Cal HHS will be delivering to the state legislature no later than the end of this year, we are also uh, required to post uh, progress on the implementation plan annually, no less uh, than annually, um, until uh, for, for the next five years. Uh, so a lot of work that we're thinking about has a lot to do with not just the implementation plan, but how do we evaluate that that what we're doing um, is working, and then what are kind of, what adjustments need to be done along the way? All right, this is the structure of um, our project, and at the very top, you see the driving goal of the five-year implementation plan, which you will be seeing shortly in about a month's time. Um, underneath, uh, you all of you have seen this. The uh, Policy Advisory Group advises Cal HHS. At the same time, we are working with a, a number of state entities uh, named in AB 988, as well as state entities that will likely be taking on responsibilities for um, support, oversight, uh, things like that. Um, the Policy Advisory Group being charged with 14 recommendation topics broke up into six work groups to address the major topics. Since we last spoke in May, um, we did add one more work group, and that is the peer supporter work group. 
they have uh, met in June and August, and their recommendations are also forthcoming to, uh, to our plan. Um, this was uh, formed uh, organically, really, by uh, policy advisory group members who had lived experience and really wanted to highlight the role of peer and family support specialists in order to provide input to the state in terms of crisis services. Um, and then, as I mentioned earlier, we also have held a key informant interviews, uh, uh, put out surveys, as well as held, I believe, at least 13 focus groups with populations of focus so that we can uh, be sure to get as much input from the community as possible into this plan. All right, the timeline of this project, um, we are now toward the end here. We are at the end of August. Um, so the final, uh, the draft implementation plan will surface um, next month, September 18th. Um, and then we'll have a public comment period during October. Um, and then we will get, hopefully, uh, a, a final draft uh, toward the end of November and present it to the state legislature in December. Uh, where we've been at is that there are have been a total now of five policy advisory group meetings to date. Um, you can see in the grayed out um, uh, numbers or, or letters there, those are the meetings that have already taken place. The most recent one was last week. Um, as I mentioned, the next policy advisory group is in about a month's time. Uh, we will um, also look at, besides the draft five-year implementation plan, we will also uh, have a more robust discussion on funding and sustainability. I know there's lots of questions about that, um, as well as uh, what is the governance structure to provide oversights and monitoring and guidance and support. Um, and then uh, we'll have some further input from our peers' um, work group. Okay, um, I think that's pretty much our timeline. I do want to get to the, uh, the advisory group and work group. Uh, uh, the AB 98 did uh, specifically um, require certain representation to the policy advisory group. That's a list of the agencies that must be uh, and representative that must be on there. We have a 43-member work group. Some of the uh, staffing has changed, but the, the organizations and um, agencies represented are, are still uh, the same. We have held. Just a second. Somebody online needs to go on mute. Did you find them, Dylan? All right. OK. Go ahead, Dr. Bowie. All right. Um, and then out of the seven work groups, um, these are the meetings that have uh, been t taking place. Um, and then there's one more meeting on funding and sustainability. It was originally uh, scheduled for next Tuesday, but there's a conflicting meeting. So we're trying to get a another, uh, where several work group members could not attend. So there will be one more meeting on funding and sustainability. Um, in early September. And all these are public meetings. Um, we post the information on how to join both in person and virtually on our website. Um, and that information will be at the end of the my slice set for you to access. Um, and as well as all the previous meetings are recorded and slice sets are available on our website publicly. Okay, I want to surface draft recommendations. So that's what the policy advisory group discussed last week. These are recommendations that have been, um, that have come from our work groups um, so that we can get to an agreement about where we want to drive to. Um, just want to kind of highlight that there are some desired outcomes of a, of a future crisis system that we want to drive toward. This was outlined by the crisis care continuum plan that agency put forth last May. Um, and these are some really goals that we want to get to in the future for our state. Um, that we get high quality crisis services, consistent statewide access, there's coordination across and outside the crisis care continuum, and that we serve all Californians regardless of location, uh, background, um, insurance status, things like that. So this is a, a high bar to, to me, and we realize that we're, it's going to take several years to get there. Um, and that AB 98 is a, is, is a section of what we want to drive toward. So where AB 988 is, 
uh, and what we are charged to do, the five-year implementation plan is likely more focused on the immediate crisis response section of what we need to do, um, but in the context of where we want to get to in the larger continuum. Um, these are some uh, uh, kind of guiding uh, principles that we want to lay out for you um, uh, in terms of what AB98 funding can help us do. Um, and then really when you see the draft implementation plan would be when we outline who are the state leads, who are our local implementation partners, as well as a timeline in terms of year one, two, three, four, five. Um, so these next recommendations aren't quite to that level of detail yet, um, but hopefully they will outline for you where we're aiming to go with the plan. Um, so the foundational principles, which are really non-negotiables um, of what we need to get to, is that we have to provide coverage for all Californians, regardless of location, insurance coverage, so that they have timely access to quality crisis care. We really want to um, make sure that 988 access um, you know, is uh, equitable, as well as allowing uh, connection to local resources. Uh, and that we would want to get individuals in crisis access to timely therapeutic care uh, and reducing unnecessary law enforcement involvement where possible. The structure of what you're going to see in the implementation plan when you do see it um, visually is how we divided up um, uh, the, the things that need to be done. So in order to get to that vision of equitable, uh, high quality, um, accessible uh, crisis uh, system for all Californians, we need to make sure that there's in um, in the there are like four goals that we really kind of want to outline here. We need to make sure that there's public awareness and trust of 988 um, and, and crisis services so that people can really use it. Um, we want to make sure that when they do use it, that the structure, infrastructure and technology is there to make sure that the routing is, is accurate and, and safe for seekers of, uh, seeking help. We want to make sure that the, the services we provide is high quality uh, and that we want to make sure that the services provided through 9AA uh, is and will be connected to, to the rest of the continuum. Uh, and then underneath there are some cross-cutting recommendations that, that really drive across all the goals and we've heard about how data is so very important. We need to understand where we are in terms of uh, current metrics as well as developing future metrics it, to make sure that we evaluate the system and get the system to where we want to be. We want to make sure that the system is funded um, sustainably. Uh, we want to make sure that we highlight recovery and peer support in the work that we do. All right, so um, I just want to highlight for you, last time I think what I did for you was there are three major tasks that the Technical Advisory Board is responsible for. So that's on the left column uh, by the uh, small uh, letter I, uh, and then how that corresponded to uh, the work groups that we've been doing in 988 Crisis Policy Advisory Group. And then the next step, step underneath, you see goal B, C, and D. What I tried to do there for you is to outline where are the goals that you're going to see in the implementation plan. So there's a lot. I mean, the statewide infrastructure and technology ties together with with just that one task that you've got going on, right? And then you've got you need to make sure there's high quality response of 98, and then you've got to make sure there's integration. So this is kind of the precise place where we go. Oh, policy and technology really go hand in hand. And for for task number two, well, we think that. Just technology is, is simple, but no, look at that. We've got to look at making sure that the technology allows for coordination of, of, of the system, uh, 988 and 911, no small task there. And then uh, task number three for this technical advisory board, um, uh, you know, again, uh, on the right-hand side is, is the, the AB 98 requirements for what the policy is supposed to come up with. Um, so I just want to highlight for you, as you read the implementation plan, where there are some places that might be helpful for you to comment. Right. So I'm going to give you some, I'm just going to pause there for a second if there's any need for call, uh, clarifying questions on what I've said so far.
All right, because next what I'm going to do is go over the recommendations that were surfaced publicly last week. Now, just just so you uh, you're clear, we've already taken feedback from our uh, community as well as the policy advisory board. So the wording might have changed. We might have added more recommendations. So by the time you see the draft again, there might be a lot more <laughs> in these uh, activities that that need to come out. But um, here's some highlights that we discussed publicly last week. So in goal B, which is uh, has to do with statewide infrastructure and technology, the idea is that we need to establish system to connect help seekers see appropriate call, chat, and text um, call takers, uh, I mean 988 operators, uh, count crisis counselors. Two key recommendations in this area is that we need to have technology in order to route 98 contacts safely and efficiently anywhere in California. Um, on the right hand side are some specific implementation activities at the state level to make sure that this happens. Um, should I be reading this or is it okay that you read it yourself? I would suggest you, because there's a whole group dedicated to this, so I think you know, if the board is comfortable, we'll. You have the data. Let's see what we have in terms of conversation when you get through. All That's right. great. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then in terms of recommend, and and by the way, these are not exhaustive lists of implementation activities, right? Because because the goal of what we want to get to, and then all the things that we think we need to do today might also have to be expanded because tomorrow, next year, we we realize we have to do more things. So the implementation activities are. are really what we know that we need to do today. Um, but certainly we'd love to take your feedback about what else we might be missing. Uh, goal, uh, and the second objective under goal B would be to have the state develop guidance and related policy to connect and transfer help seekers to the appropriate support. Um, and that includes conversations that we've had today around 988-911 transfers, as well as other helplines and other kinds of supports. Um, so this is just an outline for you of what input had surfaced at last week's meeting, sorry. Um, so we heard, I think, also from today's conversation, we need some help with clarifying definitions. So um, I think that this is where your technical expertise would be very, very helpful to us, getting clear state level definition and what interoperability, geo-routing, geolocation is. Um, we need to focus um, our recommendations and activities on consumer outcomes. The technology platform, uh, there's uh, recommendations uh, input that we want to make sure that platform can evolve to meet the needs of help seekers and call takers. Uh, we need to account for um, um, training of staff, how to use the technology, and then um, we've already talked about data reporting and collection from the technology. Uh, we've heard, again, uh, some themes that are very, very uh, clear across both uh, boards, right? The, we need uh, evidence-based protocols. We, we don't want to inv advertently perpetuate disparities in, in terms of servicing help seekers. We do want to make sure uh, we understand how different approaches in terms of community-based mobile crisis response might meet the needs for different communities. And we need some kind of state uh, wide guidance on how to transfer between 9A and other lines. All right, um, so then I'm going to go over goal C and D. So in terms of goal C, which is driving toward a high quality 9A response in order to support the delivery of high quality 9A services for all Californians, um, this goal is broken down into three smaller objectives. Um, we really need to focus on, on clinical quality uh, standards. We need to make sure that we have baseline statewide standards for staffing. We've heard that loud and clear today. And then we need to also make sure that we are, are able to review and designate 9-8 centers. I think I'll leave it up there for a minute for you to read for yourself what the activities are.
And may I proceed to the next slide? Okay. All right. Uh, the policy advisory uh, did uh, ask for us to reorganize the recommendations in order for it to make more sense uh, in terms of uh, a flow, looking at key performance indicators um, uh, that are specific to quality of services. We want to differentiate between activities that that meet current national standards, and then we need to think about activities that will need meet California's needs in the future, uh, thinking about the future crisis system that we are building right now. Uh, we need to have mechanisms for consumer feedback in the, in the evaluation process. We've heard a lot about staffing today already. I don't need to, to reiterate uh, those. Uh, that's under consideration, definitely. Um, and then we do need a state process in order to make sure that the nine, eight centers um, are uh, uh, meeting California specific standards um, and that there's um, technical assistance and state support that, that we build in for our nine, eight centers in California. Right, uh, last set of goals uh, would be goal D. We've got this as the integration of 988 and the continuum services so that there's coordination. Um, we would really want to make sure that the state actively promote collaboration and coordination of um, all the partners necessary to connect people in crisis to immediate and ongoing care as necessary. Um, we really make sure that there is timely and effective community-based res response for help seekers. And we need to, um, at the state level, look into how to support and assist communities to, to make available um, crisis receiving and uh, facilities as well as programs that can help people connect to care after a crisis, during and after a crisis. Uh, and those are the implementation activities um, that we have listed. The policy advisory group had lots of feedback. Uh, again, I uh, need to clarify um, a variety of terms, including equity, access, peer support. Uh, we need to um, talk about what will happen after an evaluation. What are some potential um, implementation activities that would improve the system after evaluation? Uh, we need to make sure um, to think about how to accommodate or account for the variety of models of community-based crisis response. Um, and, and then certainly um, highlighting what we are doing to make sure that there are safe places to be for individuals in crisis, uh, including making sure that uh, we have the ability to um, uh, bill Medi-Cal and commercial insurance and making sure there's um, really a, a good crisis system for, for folks. Okay, so next steps would be um, our last work group on funding and sustainability is meeting fairly soon. We'll announce that fairly soon. Um, I mentioned the next policy advisory group on September 18th. Um, all the links are here in this link that you can look at. I do want to highlight for you, we will be distributing a draft implementation plan in the week prior to the September 18th meeting. Uh, we will make sure that you all have a draft of that as well and we'll establish a process by which we can get feedback from you without triggering a public meeting <laughs> before a public meeting. <laughs> um, so we'll think about how to do that. Uh, and likely the best way to do that is maybe getting uh, input from you to um, the email that we have here on the last slide. And uh, if you need any further information or meeting uh, summaries or the slides from the previous meetings, please visit our website here. So I asked a legal question, when that document is received by this group, do we inadvertently trigger a serial meeting as we each individually review it and provide feedback? We don't know. So we'll get back to you on that. Um, I think probably the one way around that would be that each organization represented here provides comments and you do it in that context, not in the context of this board. Because if we did it in the context of this board, we'd have to have a meeting to formalize, you know, board feedback. But individually, I don't know, we'll see. 
we'll, we'll do some research on that. All right, so that was the legal thing that came to my mind. All right, any questions for uh, Dr. Bui on, on this presentation? Obviously, they've done a tremendous amount of work on this effort. Um, some of you sitting here, maybe, maybe most of you sitting here, have been involved in these efforts as well. So any comments or, or feedback from the board members on this? So we all know what we're doing on September 18th or 19th and 20th. We have reading assignments. <laughs> all right, any questions from the public on this agenda item? I, I just want to comment, Birch and Dr. Bui. I think that the recommendations are great, and the list of um, implementation activities are very extensive, and I think it's going to require a lot of work. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it's, yeah, but it's great. <laughs> yeah, you. absolutely. Just looking at, you know, <laughs> how extensive their review has been and being part of that process. There is a lot of work to be done, which is why it's a five-year implementation plan and not a five-month implementation plan. So um, they have highlighted many times during these meetings that it will take time to reach all of these goals and objectives. So we certainly hear you there loud and clear. All right, any other comments from either the public or any members of the board on this agenda item? All right. This magically appeared, thank you. Uh, so moving on to agenda item number seven. So this is um, a standing agenda item that we have specific to any updates from the FCC or from Vibrant. And so I'll start with the FCC updates and uh, happy to answer as many questions and dive as deep into this as you want. The FCC released a notice of proposed rulemaking. What that means is they release a document that they say, hey, we're contemplating taking this action. The FCC has specific authority over the carriers. So anything the FCC does would apply to those that are, um, when you make a 90-day call, they're providing the, the means for you to make that call. That's where the FCC has their authority. So when you read through this FCC docket number, which we've listed here, you'll see that it's directed you know, toward the carriers. Just a lot of conversation there. Over 3,000 comments were received. So this was a very um, uh, active proceeding. After the comments were received, the reply comments, which are basically the replies to the comments, were due in the end of July. So that period has ended as well. From here, the FCC has to work through and update the proposed rulemaking based on the comments received. Since there's so many, you know, it, it's going to take them some time to get through that. These FCC rulemaking processes can go as fast as six months if they're moving very, very quick, or they could be 18, 24, or longer. We have no idea how long this will take, but just know that the process is ongoing. From this point forward, the you still have an opportunity, either as a board, if we decide, and there's a separate agenda item for this, or as an individual, you can still comment on the process. It's called an ex parte. Essentially, you write a letter or you set up a meeting with the FCC relative to this docket number and you can still comment. So if there's something that you really feel strongly about that needs to get on the record to help them inform their decision, there still is time. And that's what the FCC does. They make their decision based on what's in the record, and what's in the record is what's responded to as part of this rulemaking. So that's where we are in the process. Now, at a high level, there's been a number of comments that have been received on both sides of this. There has been some confusion between geo-routing and geolocation. In other words, the ability to know exactly where you are versus the ability to just get your 90-day call to the right place so you can get the help you need. And so I think that the, the record is rich with that kind of information. I still think there's some confusion out there, but, but the FCC has, I think, the information they need. So I don't know that, that they're, they're lacking information there. There's also basically a couple of different ways to route that have been considered. One way relies on a, a tabular data set um, 
type model where you um, use some existing data on where our wire line switching centers are. There's a couple of thousand of them in our country. And so you correlate where you are relative to that wire line switching center, and then you use that static sort of tabular data to then route the call very similar to the way it's done today. That's been discussed. Another option that's been explored is the idea that we can leverage some of the carrier's capabilities to do geo routing. In other words, not correlating your location to a static data set, but actually being a little more dynamic and knowing the lat long roughly of where you are. Um, you know, think about when we're sitting in this room here and you pick up your cell phone, you communicate via access through a cell tower. And that same cell tower is supporting hundreds, if not thousands of people in like a one to two mile radius. So all we know is you're somewhere in Sacramento. We don't know much about that. But that's enough to know that when you make that 988 call chat or chat, that it should go to Wellspace because Wellspace is the agency that services us where we are, regardless of what your area code is or where you're really from. That's what geo routing is all about. And if we borrow those dynamic mechanisms and the call arrives at a 988 center, for those 1% of calls or 3 to 5%, depending on what stats you look at, that actually become 911 due to exigent circumstance, you can very quickly get the actual location after law enforcement has made the determination that this is an exigent circumstance and you should absolutely know exactly where the person is. Um, so those are the kinds of things that are being discussed right now and we'll see how the FCC comes out in their rulemaking. So that's kind of where this FCC process is today. And I, I, again, don't know when the rule will come out, but that's where we are. Any, any questions or comments on that? I know it's a lot of technical babble for those of you that aren't like engineers. I think it's kind of cool because I'm an engineer, but. <laughs> All right. In addition, Vibrant has circulated a new network agreement and our centers are in active discussions with Vibrant relative to that network agreement. And so that's an ongoing discussion um, that's currently underway, underway as well. So those are probably the two major updates for this slide. Any other comments or questions or anything you're hearing relative to this that we missed from the board? Okay. Any questions online or, or from the public relative to agenda item number seven? I have, I have a question, yeah. Raj, sorry. Um, the, on the agenda at the last meeting or meeting before that, we did have a letter to be sent there. Is that letter, I assume, is, is tabled now? It sounds like those comments were received, or did the agency end up sending some abbreviated or other form? So we will discuss that more in agenda item number nine, but the letter that we reviewed last time was not sent because what the letter was asking them to do was do a proposed rulemaking, which they did. So maybe we made that happen by not even sending the letter who knows um but that's essentially what that letter was so uh was asking them to do the very process they started so good timing on that but we did not end up sending the letter cal oes did file comments as part of we're we're one of the three thousand and uh those comments i think were a few pages long and it reflected everything that this board has been discussing so um if you want to um, look at those. Um, we, they're certainly available. If you can't find them and you want to see them, reach out to us. We can get them to you. All right. Any other questions? A question online? All right. Go ahead. Hey, Budge. Matt Taylor here from uh, DD Hirsch. Just uh, sort of um, adding to your summary here about uh, geo routing and to sort of make it explicit the obvious point that the 988 centers are really, really looking forward to this and really hopeful um, about how it's just going to improve all the routing efficiencies for all the reasons you just noted. And we are awaiting uh, reports now uh, from Vibrant uh, that will predict how our volume is likely to be changing. They're rolling these predictive volume change reports out across the country to the centers that are most going to experience the highest level of volume changes initially. Uh, so centers like D.D. Hirsch and Wellspace, for example, would be probably in that category. Um, 
and that'll help us, you know, better understand um, whether, you know, given we're in a cities where there's net migration losses or gains, uh, whether we're going to be seeing volume increases or decreases. So that it may change some of the, um, obviously the staffing needs of certain centers, but, but at present, Vibrant is not predicting uh, radical changes in volume to most centers and even the largest centers, um, you know, they don't think would have volume changes in excess of a 25% gain or loss. But of course, 25% of a high volume center is still a lot of contacts. Regardless, we're all very, very, like I said, hopeful, enthusiastic for um, this change. And what we understand is that the geo routing is going to start actually being implemented and rolled out this fall um, by the top three carriers. So thanks much. All right. Thank you. I appreciate that. Any other comments uh, from the public or from the board on agenda item number seven? All right. Seeing, hearing none. All right. Agenda item number eight. We had this on our agenda, thinking that we might be farther through this document for today's board meeting. Um, we are not. Uh, obviously, this is directly tied to the work that's happening in the policy advisory group, as well as the ongoing work that's happening in our 911 to 988 transfer working group that's happening within this board. So we will refresh this document we will get it back out to you and i, I think we, we're going to have a really robust conversation on this in november and we'd like to get this guidance out there at least in some form um, certainly because the number of questions that are circulating about what this is going to be um, there's you know a lot of questions around this so we just want to get it out there so i don't know if any of the board members have any follow-on conversation relative to this but We'll keep this on as an agenda item for next board meeting. Um, I do have a quick question. Uh, I'm noticing on the 988 page that the version of the draft transfer protocol is from March. So will this updated draft that's t taken in comments also be up updated for access on the website? Yes, we will. and. Um, we will have an updated version of this document posted at least 30 days before we meet in November is the goal so that everybody has an, an opportunity. And that updated version will reflect all of the feedback received and the recommendations from the working group on the feedback received. So I can't say that everything that was requested to be modified will happen because we really want the working group to do that. The working group has a, a much larger and I think diverse representation than is what's sitting at this table with regard to this one you know, item. Um, so if you're at all concerned in the outcome of this, then please join the working group, right? And, and really be involved in the conversation at that level. And if you want information on how you do that, just reach out to Samantha. She can, uh, she's more than able to point you in the direction to the working group. So really that's where this is gonna happen. And I'm looking to the working group to make a recommendation up to us that we then look at from a state perspective. So when you come in November, have your state you know, hat on, you know, so to speak, so that you're looking at something that's gonna work for everybody and maybe not your exact entity and really take a close look if anything in the policy would prevent you from being effective or the agency you represent from being effective. That's really what we want to avoid. Um, this is a guidance document. We're really trying to take this forward to put something out there that um, is actionable by every single 911 and 988 center in the state. So no pressure. <laughs> All right, any other comments on this online or in the room? Okay, next uh, agenda item is really related to, to something that Eric mentioned. So the proposed rulemaking is out there. It's happening. The question before us is, do we need to consider any action as a board to further inform that process? I don't know how many of you have read through all 3,000 comments. I have not. I've read through probably 100 of the comments, um, and I think Jessica's read through probably more than that. Um, so we've read through it. There's a, a wealth of information out there. Uh, it, we don't have to decide today, but if there's something you've already read or you've heard where there's a gap, 
that you think this board should weigh in on to help inform the process, there is a way to do that. You, we would write an ex parte letter as an advisory board and send it to the FCC. So that's absolutely possible. Not easy, but is possible. So um, the, the challenge we'd have is, you know, we'd have to, you know, draft said letter, which we've already done once, so we can certainly do it again, review it as a board, and then uh, choose to adopt it and then send it out. And so the earliest we would send this would probably be sometime in November, but we can certainly do it. So I put this as a placeholder based on the conversation from the last meeting we had that we wanted to discuss this. And so it's here and open for discussion for the board. So I'll entertain any discussion on should we do an ex parte letter to the FCC as a board. It sounds, if I can, yeah. uh, it sounds like many of the concerns or asks in our original letter were answered or have been received. Um, a new piece perhaps that's come up is what mechanism of geo-routing will the FCC allow states to have? And so, Budge, you described there's a more tabular static version and then there's a more kind of real-time dynamic version. Um, and there may be advantages to that uh, dynamic version. Uh, it's more future-proof. It is more in line with the, the next-gen infrastructure that California has. And, um, the, the, the tabular version is, is, is static. And if there were to be changes in technology or changes in other things, then that would have to be changed or have to be modified again in a way that the dynamic one wouldn't be. Um, that being said, uh, I'm not the expert on what infrastructure all the centers have access to and all the PSAPs have access to. From your perspective, is the way California's infrastructure set up really, um, is there a big advantage in, in one or the other? and big enough advantage that we should let the FCC know that. So in the comments that Cal OES put forward, we, we used an or. Either the tabular method so that some states that don't have the infrastructure that we have have access to that, or this more advanced version. And so as long as that's in place, we would not you know, have to go back to the FCC to do something different. If it's only one or the other, somebody's probably going to get left out down the road. Uh, it's way better than what we have now. Make no mistake about it. But these things take time, and once this proceeding is done, it will be five, ten years before there's any change. We're bringing our knowledge of the 911 space, and that once this is in place, it will probably be a decade before any changes happen. So what that means is, if the tabular legacy method is used, we can make it work. It's a huge improvement from what we have today. But when you want to do additional things like be able to pull the system for the exact location of the caller in an exigent circumstance, you'll have to rely on the legacy way to do that, which is a 10 to 20 minute process to figure out where the person is once you've determined that they absolutely need help now to save their lives. And that's really the focus that we have. So I think it's probably up to this board to contemplate how important is that, how you know how much information do we want to put on it. That type of data is already on the record. So don't you know? But it would just be sort of re-emphasizing that. I, I think is is kind of where we're at. I think you've answered my question though that either or is what is already included in the letter, and so we would have that flexibility. Yeah. All right. Any other comments on that? The questions from the board. All right, any comments or questions online on agenda item number nine? All right, so from the board, do we want to keep this as a standing item or just roll it back into our regular FCC uh, update? Do you want to? I'm interested to have this uh, as a standing item just because how important it is to the 98 centers. Okay, we'll make sure we keep this front and center. We'll track any updates that are made and if we hear anything, uh, we'll certainly push it out to, to the group as an update. Okay, all right. Okay, so we're now up to um, agenda items for future meetings. Our next meeting is on November 21st. Um, it will be somewhere, probably on this campus, unless one of you invites us to come visit you and has a meeting room for us. 
Um, so aside from the agenda items that are on today's agenda, is there anything else that you want to add to a future meeting? Anything else we're not talking about that we should be? Yeah, go ahead, Serene. Um, has it been uh, has it been looked into as far as um, translators, like nine for nine eight eight centers? Because I, obviously the majority is Spanish speaking, but there is a lot of um, even when I use a translator for Spanish speakers, like they are not like my Spanish. I'm I'm fairly good at Spanish, but like the translator will be like saying something completely different, and then I'm like. I, ma'am that's not what I or they, that's not the address they gave so um, and then I've used anything from like you know all kinds of different languages so um, has it also been um, is that something that's going to be available to the 98 centers so we have already the capability well, so on the existing platform that vibrance provided there is a, a language interpretation service. I'm not overly familiar with how they do it. Somebody else who is more familiar might be able to speak to that. But in addition, the 911, um, we do have a language translation service. I think it might be subject to some of the same things you're using now because that's the world you come from. So that is available to our 98 centers. We've got that. And we're also looking at additional technologies um, that, that can do this more from more of a um, machine learning perspective, in other words, the automatic translation, similar to like what you see with Google Translate, only more enhanced. Uh, those features are available to be rolled out in the platform once we get it out there and live. So we have had these conversations, um, but it, right now what's available to the centers is either what's being provided through the services that Vibrant provides or through the state um, foreign, language trans, um, foreign language translation contract. That's available today. All right. Go ahead, Joe. Um, so only my second meeting, so hopefully I get invited to a third after this. Um, <laughs> but uh, it, we talked, a lot of this is touched on um, call routing and voice traffic and stuff, and the budget that was proposed was based on call volume. Uh, what about uh, uh, direct video um, calls and stuff? It, it, um, is there a budget line item for internet circuits and things like that? Yeah, there is. So the, the technology that we've built and deployed includes a video interface um, as part of that contract. I don't know the details of it. I can get back to you on that. But um, And we also build out the connectivity to the centers that they need to access this, this technology, the, the 98 call handling system as well as the 98 customer relationship management software. So if the center does not have access to, you know, those types of connections, we do provide it. Where we run into challenges is the 988 fees are very specific. So if there are other business lines that are active at that center or at that facility that go beyond 988, we have to be very careful. And we've worked individually with each centers to figure all that out. So um, so the short answer is yes, that is included. Okay. Um, and we can certainly give you more detail if you want to know. And we, we, you know, we could certainly meet one-on-one just, one yeah, just, just to show to you. Yeah. Funding available yep. for the circuits. And so. Yep, it is. It's in the contract, absolutely. Okay. Great. Thank you. Okay. Go ahead, Dr. Bui. May I just add some additional clarification in terms of language access? That for, when you call 98, you can press 2 to get connected to a Spanish speaking trained 98 crisis counselor. Um, and then there are 240 additional languages available to 98 right now through Language Line Solutions through the current national platform. And we have the same similar access. If if that service is not available, there's we have a state contract as well that, that these centers can, can leverage too. Yep. OK, you had a question? I just had a question for possible future agenda items. I think I understood that there's a RFP for contracts regarding technology for dispatching mobile crisis. Is there, are we at a place where maybe there's a overview of what that might look like or yeah. the thinking behind that? Yeah, so we will certainly add that to the branch update for the next time we meet. 
By then, the contract will have been awarded. That'll be September. So we'll give you um, a really good overview of what that is, as well as what needs to be done next. Because while the technology is in place, the gap that exists in that space today is who is actually going to be the dispatch entity for each one of these centers. And the contract leaves open as to who that would be, but that conversation has to be had. And so that's a one by one with each center. And then once that determination is made, they have to work to ensure that that dispatching location entity can do all the dispatch and so all the pieces are there. And that's exactly what this contract is gonna do. So we'll have some graphics for you. We'll walk you through where we are in the process. It will take you know, 12 months to test, develop, and roll out. So, you know, from when the contract is signed. And we want to be very careful to align to the implementation plan, which right now we've been in lockstep with, but that's a part of the conversation as well. And then you run into this whole challenge of how are the mobile crisis response teams identified? How are they funded? Which ones are supported? Which ones are not? And, and so we're going to have to unravel that. Thankfully, the technology is agnostic to that. Once they are identified, the technology will support them. It's um, just figuring out all those policy things. So, you know, I, that that will be the larger part of this conversation. Yeah. And how do you facilitate that? And so, yes. Yeah. So I've got that as a note, and Jessica's already over there, probably writing slides right now on 988 mobile data solution or mobile dispatch solution. Yeah. Okay. Other future agenda items. Any other board members online? No? Okay. If I could just brainstorm because November uh, 20th is when the yes. <laughs> yeah, final the day before us. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. I don't know if that's something that will become a topic of discussion or not. So maybe what we should do is we should um, add an uh, agenda item to discuss working groups that, that we could contemplate. That way we've got it on the agenda in case there is something that needs to be. Because this, this board can form working groups and we can hear recommendations and make a motion and, and establish those groups. We have the ability to do that. That's how we came up with the working groups that we have. So I'll add that on as a working group um, discussion. There may be a need for something. I fully anticipate the policy advisory group asking the technical advisory board to form a working group to support certain follow-on activities in support of the implementation plan. Just saying. That might come up. <laughs> okay. Duly noted. Anything else? All right. Any comments from members of the public on agenda item number 10? All right, seeing, hearing none. Uh, item 11 is public comment. So we'll start with members of the board for any comments or any discussion you want to have for something that wasn't on the agenda, something that you hope to talk about today that we didn't include. Now's your time to bring anything up that wasn't on the agenda. All right, do we have any public comment in general? online or in the room looking I'm waiting i'm waiting i'm seeing nothing okay all right we move to item number 12 which is adjournment and i'm checking a time check wow we, we did it we got it done in two hours which is uh which is good um, i'm excited about that all right so do we have a motion to adjourn move to adjourn all right, from Lon, thank you. Do we have a second? Second to adjourn. All right, second from Demetrius, thank you. All right, we are adjourned. By my clock, it's 1149. So thank you, everybody, for your attendance, and we look forward to the next conversation in November. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.